Mercury, in Roman mythology, is the god of merchants and travelers, transporters of goods and thieves. Given what we've got planned for Mercury's future, that planet is well named indeed. So today we are returning to the Outward Bound series after a few months hiatus to look at colonizing Mercury, probably one of the most neglected planets in science fiction. Mars gets a lot of attention, as does Venus, but even the various moons get more attention than Mercury does. This is a pity, because there are a lot of options there for Mercury, some of which we've mentioned in passing before, and when I sat down with the production crew on our SFIA Discord server to chat about those, we came up with pages of different possible approaches to making Mercury useful, and even a pleasant place to live. Traditionally, Mercury is seen as having one big problem and one big use. It's scorching hot because it's so close to the Sun, and being basically a big airless ball of silicon and metal, we usually figure on using it as a giant building supply store to construct power collectors and in the long term to completely disassemble it to form the basis of a Dyson Swarm. But there is a lot of time between starting up some mines and power collection near Mercury and totally disassembling it. Taking apart planets is not a fast process, and requires civilizations to exist far longer than any in our history. We often talk about the problems in science fiction, and futurism in general, of people not really getting scale right, and lifetimes of colonies is a good example of that. We might point at a supergiant star with a lifetime of a hundred million years, already more than halfway done, and say, you wouldn't colonize that, while forgetting that compared to any civilizations which have ever existed, that's nearly an eternity. If some big island rose up from the depths of the Pacific tomorrow, covered in fertile mud, and geologists said it would sink in a thousand years, many would of course rush to claim and colonize it. Many folks would shake their heads and point out that it was doomed, but the last laugh would presumably be on them, since that's a millennium for a culture to flourish on. Even Rome, the eternal city, and the standard by which we tend to judge long-lasting civilizations, lasted only about this long. You don't need to be around long to have a lasting impact on humanity, our culture or technology, let alone just have a long and productive life. Nor is the need to eventually move really a problem, after all, your ancestors would have moved or you wouldn't be there. So not only can a great civilization be worth having even if it would only last a few centuries, but it's quite rare for them to even last that long. That's something worth remembering when we talk about colonizing places, they'd go through a lot of phases and a lot of history, even if they had much sooner expiration dates than billions of years. Whether or not Mercury might get disassembled is probably a long way down the road, so today we'll focus on near and midterm colonization. But let's start by talking about Mercury and how and why we want to start a basic colony there. Mercury, of course, is the closest planet to the Sun, and thus we tend to think of it as the hottest, but Venus beats it out slightly for peak temperature, and Mercury gets downright cold at night. Unlike Venus, it has no atmosphere worthy of note, just a thin haze of mostly hydrogen and helium from captured solar wind that soon enough evaporates away and gets replaced by more of it. The surface pressure of that atmosphere is less than in low Earth orbit by the space station, and so can be mostly disregarded. Like Venus, it has a peculiarly long day. It was once believed to be tidally locked to the Sun, like the Moon is to the Earth, which means a 1 to 1 orbital resonance where the day and year are the same length, leaving one side eternally lit by the Sun and the other in darkness. But actually, Mercury is in a 3 2 orbital resonance meaning it rotates on its axis three times for every two orbits around the Sun, which it does every 88 days. It rotates once on its axis every 59 days, two-thirds of 88 days, but that is not its day-night length. Indeed Earth doesn't take 24 hours to rotate 360 degrees, just 23 hours and 56 minutes, what we call the sidereal day, the time for one complete rotation. But as it's moving around the Sun, it takes just a bit longer on each rotation for the Sun to be in the same place, to set on the horizon, 
just 4 minutes resulting in a 24 hour day night cycle, what we call the synodic day, though of course we just call it the day. However on Mercury the rotation is so long and the orbit so short that this effect is considerably magnified. The sidereal day on Mercury is 59 days long, while the synodic day, the time for one day-night cycle, is 176 days, or two Mercury years. That's a very long time to wait between sunrises and sunsets. More importantly though, with an equatorial circumference of just over 15,000 kilometers, the day-night terminator only moves 87 kilometers a day or 3.6 kilometers per hour at the equator, walking speed. Move up north or south to say 60 degrees latitude and that's cut in half, at 76 degrees it would be only a quarter and you could keep ahead of the rising sun if you were strolling and camping to rest along the way. We'll be talking about mobile bases, colonies just rolling around on wheels or rail later today, and they wouldn't need to move too fast particularly up by those poles. If you're curious, if you take the cosine of your latitude, north or south, and multiply it by the planet's circumference, 15,300 kilometers for Mercury, or by pi times its diameter, then divide by how many hours in its day, that will tell you how fast you need to move to keep up with the Sun, such that it would never set or stay out of it, so it would never rise. Ideally you don't want to be around when the Sun is up on Mercury, since the temperatures at noon would flash fry you, but you wouldn't want to be there at midnight either. Its temperature ranges from hotter than your oven to colder than liquid oxygen or nitrogen, so if you could be mobile, you'd probably want to chase around that terminator, staying just where you could catch some solar power but where it hadn't heated up or cooled down much yet. You'd presumably have a ring rolling around the planet's poles that was a comfortable room temperature and want to stay near there if you could. As I said, Mercury is not tidally locked, it doesn't have a stationary day and night side. There's some debate if this might ever change, as Mercury has a particularly high orbital eccentricity which makes a 1 to 1 resonance less likely. Indeed it's the most eccentric orbit of any planet, now that we don't count Pluto, which is so eccentric that it is often closer to the Sun than Neptune, and in fact was from 1979 to 1999. Mercury doesn't ever become our second planet, even at aphelion. When it's furthest from the Sun at 70 million kilometers it's still a lot closer than Venus ever gets, but at perihelion Mercury gets to just 46 million kilometers from the Sun, that means it gets half again as far from the Sun at aphelion than perihelion, and since light from the Sun falls off inverse square of the distance, it only gets 40% as much light and energy at aphelion as it does at perihelion. So even keeping up with a terminator won't give you a stable temperature. Nor is that sunlight very healthy even where the temperature hasn't risen much yet, there's no air there filtering out the harmful frequencies of sunlight. This of course is one approach to colonizing Mercury for mining, you set up your camp where it's cool and move on when the light and heat are too much. You drive ahead to some place that's colder but not quite so cold you can't walk there, set up your camp again and do some more mining and move on. Think of the sand crawlers from Dune that harvested the spice melange only you're running from the sun rather than giant sandworms. You probably want to make sure you've got backup vehicles and engines in case one dies, and you can use the extra energy while moving to power your smelters and refineries. Needless to say, heating things up on Mercury to smelt them isn't too hard. A solar oven would work quite well there, with no clouds and being that close to the sun. Mercury's night side is also a good place to get rid of heat, something hard to find anywhere else near the sun. You can create a cool day anywhere in space by just putting a mirror between you and the Sun, but if you're generating a lot of heat, you can only get rid of that by radiating it away. Down on Mercury's night side, you can use conduction too, so you might have mobile factories at work, not just mining and refining operations. Of course getting what you produced off Mercury isn't too hard either, Mercury has an escape velocity of just 4.2 km per second, and an orbital velocity of just 3 km per second. Moreover, it has no air, so you don't even need any of those impressive launch systems we've discussed like launch loops or orbital rings. If you had a flat track you could drive on down there, without worrying about friction on the wheels, you could literally drive down that highway, flooring your engine, until your car left the ground. Not because you'd hit flight speed, there's no air lift or drag, but because you'd hit orbital speed. Setting up a track something can run down, a mass driver, 
is a lot easier here because you don't need a tube around it to evacuate air out. You have way weaker gravity so building tall is easier and you need less speed. And you don't have to elevate the launch tube anyway, as there's no air to lift it over, so you just have to bridge over any craters you came across. It's actually landing on Mercury that's a pain, as again there's no air, so much like on our moon, we can't aero brake to shed velocity for free. Though you might be able to hit a very long track, very precisely, and slowly shed speed off without friction, or run down a magnetic tube, the reverse of a typical mass driver, to let it leech your speed off as power, rather than inserting power to give a ship speed. This gives you a good reason to consider building a track all the way around Mercury, and it need not be at the equator either if you wanted to keep it shorter. Mercury gets hot, but it is still cool enough for many metals to handle, even steel, which is fairly mundane considering some of the materials we might use, retains its magnetic and conductive properties at those temperatures, and one thing Mercury is not lacking in is metals. One would still have to worry about metal fatigue though, as some metals there would be expanding and contracting to varying degrees as they ran up from temperatures cold enough to liquefy air to temperatures hot enough to melt lead, but this is happening once a Mercury day, which is very long, so it's not being heated and cooled constantly and breaking quickly as a result. And we know a lot of tricks for various alloys and composites that minimize metal fatigue these days anyway. However, while the surface of Mercury is constantly fluctuating in temperature, every planet has a vertical temperature gradient. Here on Earth, if you dig down a bit, you'll hit a spot where the temperature stops varying much by time of day, dig down a bit deeper and it will stop varying much over the course of a whole year. How deep you need to go for each spot varies on your latitude and soil type but the mean Earth temperature is usually reached after about 4-5 to five meters. Mercury should have such a spot too, if you dig down a little bit, but as it receives far more light than Earth and has a bigger core, it's unlikely to be a comfortable temperature in many spots. There was some modeling done on this, and variation on the methods, but interestingly Mercury's temperature varies by longitude, not just latitude, as it does have that highly eccentric orbit and long day in orbital resonance. But, depending on the model, we start seeing human livable temperatures underground, even away from craters as we get closer to the poles, and in one of the more optimistic models, even room temperature underground at the equator at 90 degrees west. Regardless, it is going to stabilize at some depth, which would help with the expansion and contraction causing fatigue and other construction problems regardless of that equilibrium temperature. So you could retract bits of the track or other constructs underground or even build that way, down in tunnels built with a tunnel boring machine that mines and leaves you with habitable space, and we will discuss air conditioning in a little bit. So that's one possible option so far. We've got the mobile one where you pick up and move sporadically, or keep your base constantly moving, powered by solar to run your vehicle bases, and we've also got the retracting option where things fall down at night and brightest day and pop back up when things are more moderate but you don't necessarily need to do either. We've discussed something I called a mushroom habitat before. This is where you stick your habitat up on stilts that aren't thermally conductive so you aren't getting much heat from the ground, and put a big umbrella over it covered in mirrors to bounce light away, one that could flip open or move aside to let in however much light you wanted at that time too. Once more, there's no air so heat can only get to you by absorbing sunlight or touching the ground and conducting it up no convection. You probably don't need anything high-tech like aerogel to build those stilts or pads out of, just something that doesn't conduct heat well, likely made from the silicate beneath you, nor does that habitat or big mushroom cat meal shade require any fancy engineering, as there's no wind pushy on it and not much gravity pulling it down either. You might be able to make it tiltable so it's just always blocking the sun from hitting your habitat and the ground near it as the sun slowly rises and sets over the course of 176 days. The other handy thing about not having air resistance is that you can spin the habitat to combine centrifugal force with local gravity for a higher net gravity. As we discussed before, you can combine centrifugal force with local gravity, sloping your floor to let you merge those two perpendicular forces for a higher effective net gravity. Odds are pretty good Mercury's gravity, again the same as what Mars has, is enough for people to live with some healthy exercise and supplements, but if not, 
or if it's uncomfortable, you can go the spin habitat route, as we suggested doing on the Moon or bodies with a significant surface gravity but not quite enough for health and comfort. So that gives us three options for living there, and again there's no problem getting power as the sun provides plenty, at least during the day. Those are some pretty long nights if you're not mobile. That can be gotten around by using orbital power satellites, and building big power satellites is very likely to be something done on Mercury for collecting power up near the Sun to beam back to Earth or other places. However that big change in temperature constantly going on in the ground is pretty nice for thermocouples too, as is that large molten core for geothermal during the nights. This got us thinking about generating power using that temperature difference and with big long tracks running around the planet, and we came up with an interesting fusion of all these ideas that provided a lot of complementary options and handy redundancy. If you built one or more facilities by one of the poles, you can make that track around the planet quite short. You can have solar panels nearby that are constantly feeding sunlight in, and flipping over or retracting if the heat or light becomes too intense. Those also act as nice radiators to get rid of waste heat, as they have large surface areas. Buried underneath the track could be long wires carrying power to wherever the bases were, but you could also have big wide pipes carrying coolant, be that water or whatever, and indeed we think there is water in some craters at Mercury's poles, it's actually quite cool there, relatively speaking. That coolant could help regulate temperatures for bases, and even those solar collectors or other constructs. What's more, a big ring of fluid at different temperatures is easily modified into a Stirling engine and represents a viable power source, and a pretty big one all on its own. We were talking a couple of months back about how civilizations are defined as much by what they have a scarcity of as an abundance of, and in the case of Mercury we can say two things, they have a lot of raw materials to build stuff out of and the power to run it. As we said earlier in the series when we looked at colonizing Saturn's moon Titan and how its huge abundance of cold made computing and industry more efficient, here on Mercury, while computing would be rough, the sheer amount of raw materials, silicon in particular, and energy make industry a pretty viable option, and there's no atmospheres or oceans to pollute. As we also said in our look at Titan, colonizing a place does not necessarily mean we are making it Earth-like or even living there, but as we can see, you could live there easily enough. None of this is very high tech or hard to do and allows a lot of over-engineering and redundancy to keep folks safe if bits and pieces fail. In this case, folks could slowly harvest material from Mercury, whittling away at its mass, for a very long time without making much of a dent. Earth's steel production is a bit over a billion tons a year. Even if Mercury exported a hundred times that, a hundred billion tons a year, of various metals or manufactured goods, it would take around a billion years just to reduce that planet's mass by a couple of percent, with no real effect on the local gravity. That's a very long time for a very productive civilization to last. Of course you might decide you want to terraform it, and as we discussed with other places, we can make it fairly Earth-like large mirrors or shades, orbiting or at the Lagrange point between it and the Sun, the L1, could be used to cool the planet down, and by use of those mirrors, orbiting the planet once a day, an Earth day, produce a 24-hour day-night cycle. Mercury is massive enough to hoard a breathable atmosphere, and so long as you aren't letting the solar wind strip that off, it will stick around if added, as would water. Indeed with that solar wind blocked, Its own magnetosphere and the addition of an atmosphere will help block remaining radiation. Mercury has plenty of oxygen in the rocks, and that's plentiful everywhere. It could get its nitrogen from Venus, which has plenty but has a boiling hot atmosphere between it and its metals, and we might prefer to get them from Mercury instead. With all that power and industrial capacity, it has the coin it needs to buy what it needs to make it a livable place. You could of course spin it up by launching matter you've extracted from the planet from mass drivers to their destinations, so long as you timed and aimed that right, you could slowly increase Mercury's rotational rate. You could also, and more easily, slow it down even more so it was tidally locked, giving you a permanent day and night side and areas of stable temperature, 
just fluctuating as Mercury got closer or further from the Sun over its year of a mere 88 days. Which might make that big cooling loop and stalling engine we discussed earlier work even better. Indeed you could mess with its eccentric orbit too, normalizing that by the same method. Like Venus, it needs hydrogen, but it's far closer to the Sun, which has plenty, and is hit by solar wind, rich in hydrogen and helium, both things it could collect and use or sell. This could also serve as yet another source of power, using a big meal or shade between the planet and the Sun, acting as a giant windmill driven by the solar wind. There are some interesting tricks for doing this with nanomaterials we may discuss in the future, but it could be done by just having a big pinwheel shape or several, potentially with paddles spaced to let light through, in a 24-hour pattern. These could also be used to slow down and funnel large amounts of solar wind to the polar collectors. Mercury's magnetosphere does tend to already funnel that in by the poles, similar to our polar auroras. We couldn't find an example of this in the literature, so after a bit of debate we settled on naming it a Star Wheel, and the potential massive factories using that captured solar wind and energy and raw materials from Mercury, a Star Forge, as a hat tip to the Knights of the Old Republic. Done properly, you could use most of these options together to make Mercury a very livable place you could walk around the lush forests and fields of while exporting huge quantities of energy, raw materials, and manufactured goods to the rest of the solar system. It's also a great place to build stuff for space, not just solar collectors for near the Sun, but even ships. Mercury, named for the fleet-footed messenger of the gods, is the fastest planet, orbiting the Sun at 48 kilometers per second or over 100,000 miles per hour, a nice boost to a ship wanting to leave the system even though it will lose much of that as it has to work its way out of the Sun's gravity well. But as we discussed in Colonizing the Sun, you can build enormous lasers there, such as the Star Laser, and it's much easier to keep a powerful beam locked onto a ship to push it when it's closer. Such a vessel, built and launched from Mercury and pushed by Star Lasers, could pick up a lot of speed as it headed out of the solar system, a possible alternative to our usual approach of assuming a fusion-powered ship launched from some icy moon or asteroid deep out in the solar system where the gravity well of the Sun is mostly gone and hydrogen for fusion fuel and propellant is plentiful. It's always important to me in this series that we look at a different way of approaching colonization for each episode, which is why we probably won't do one for every planet and why I initially skipped Mercury for terraforming. It's a lot like Venus and I always think of it as just a big supply depot for building a Dyson Swarm. In hindsight though, I do regret that. As we can see, there are a lot more options for Mercury than at first glance. Sadly I'm not alone in that bias, and it gets rather neglected in fiction. There are not too many colonies on Mercury in sci-fi, and when they are mentioned at all, it tends to be very briefly. There's one in our Book of the Month from last week, Dennis E. Taylor's Singularity Trap, and it's the center of the 2005 novel Mercury by Ben Bova my personal favorite in his Grand Tour series, as well as the home for a lot of characters in David Brin's 1980 novel Sundival in his Uplift Saga, but a lot of the fiction on it dates back to the older days of sci-fi where we knew less about it, and in novels where the science part of science fiction was mostly ignored. Again, we can see a lot of options on the table for making it a fairly interesting place to live, so perhaps we'll see some more novels giving it a central stage. Good science fiction doesn't have to put a focus on science, but I think it's better when it does, and certainly as one learns more science it can be rather irritating when an author makes a mistake on that, points to all three of those authors, Taylor, Bova, and Brin, for being in the minority who always do their homework and know their science, and their works are made more enjoyable by that. I mentioned how Mercury's low escape velocity affords it numerous benefits like requiring less energy to export materials, but how low can we go? If you want to understand further about escape velocity and its implications, then I recommend that you check out Brilliant.org. They have a course on applying Newtonian gravity to escape velocity, which also covers the technical planning for interplanetary travel and extends the effects on stability of planetary orbits and the solar system. I found the explanation of how escape velocity emerges from gravity straightforward and intuitive, and I recommend that you check it out. 
if you want to learn how to quickly understand the depths of everything an aspiring space traveler would need, go to Brilliant.org slash Isaac Arthur and sign up for free, and also, the first 200 people that go to that link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. That's the subscription I've been using to explore concepts like Escape Velocity. As a quick heads up before we talk about what's scheduled for next week, last week I sat down for an interview on Tomorrow with Athena Brensbogel to discuss some of the implications of topics we look at here, then join the rest of the Tomorrow crew for a fun chat later in that episode. I'll post a link to that in the video description below. So the Outward Bound series came out of hiatus to look at Mercury and we'll be coming back to it again soon to look at Ceres, the Queen of the Asteroid Belt, and arguably our fifth planet in which context Pluto would presumably be the tenth, or Planet X. Before that we'll be looking at the notion of civilizations rising and falling, over and over again, and what traces they might leave behind, if they could rebuild afterward when some resources might be gone, and how this might fit in with the Fermi Paradox in Cyclical Apocalypse. The week after that, we'll return to our look at post-scarcity civilizations and ask what sort of purposes might motivate and drive people in a society that is essentially a utopia, and what might happen if those folks don't have a purpose to their existence. For alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel, and if you enjoyed this episode, hit the like button and share it with others. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.